give an abbreviated title. And before I forget, I should say that portions of what I'm going to say are joint um, with three other people. So that's Tadeus uh, Ekum, John Ednayer, and Mike Sullivan. And I'll try to remember to attribute them whenever it's sort of in the end. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to... Okay, this is going to be a fairly content-free talk somehow. I'm going to sweep a lot of stuff under the rug. Uh, but I'd like to give an, an overview or an advertisement for, for a strategy that um, produces various sorts of nice invariants um, through contact geometry. And so this, this program has been going on for a while now, but uh, so what I, the way I want to advertise it today is by giving some, some new results. Um, and in particular, some, some applications to transverse knots. So the, the idea um, is to use something, um, what I guess now we call the Konumu construction, which I'll describe later on. And uh, maybe the holomorphic curves context more specifically uh, something called contact homology to um, obtain so sort of interesting invariants of two knots and also of what are called transverse knots. Um, and okay, so so everybody knows what a smooth knot is, so maybe I'll, I'll remind you what a transverse knot is. Um, and I'm going to use a, a very specific situation. So this situation is, uh, I'm going to consider R3 with the standard contact structure. So the standard contact structure is a two-plane distribution in R3, which is the kernel of the one form dz minus ydx. And that's all you need to know about it. Um, so uh, definition is that a not So, so I should really say an, an oriented knot is transverse if um, along its orientation, the direction of its orientation, this one form dz minus ydx is always positive. Okay, so, so the, the reason for the, the name transverse, I guess, Clear. So, so if you have some knots here, uh, this contact plane distribution, at every point it, it gives you some plane. And this is supposed to be, okay, I don't know how to draw this. This is supposed to be transverse, but that doesn't look transverse at all. But it's, so it's supposed to be transverse to this two plane distribution at all points. Um, and moreover, so there's this positivity thing. So you, you can think of this contact structure as being co-oriented, and then this is supposed to be positively oriented with respect to the co-orientation of the context structure. Okay. Um, and we want to study these things up to what's called transverse isotopy. And this is isotopy, just usual isotopy, but through transverse knots. Um, so this is of interest in, in contact topology, and maybe I'll, I'll give some alternate description of this for, for those of you who haven't seen this before or don't care about contact manifolds. So um, there's, there's an alternate picture that's, maybe I'll say it's due to Benneke, uh, which relates, which allows us to think of transverse knots as, as uh, braids instead. Um, so I apologize to you, those of you for whom this is old hat, but it'll be over soon. Um, so the idea is that if one, okay, start with a braid, um, and then it kind of gives you some natural way to associate to it a transverse knot. Um, a 
essentially by, by gluing the braid around uh, in, inside of a small tubular neighborhood of some standard transverse unknot. Um, and so this, so Medikan shows that this is a well-defined map, so it's invariant under braid isotopy, and it's also, uh, this is actually a surjective map. So all transverse knots uh, you can get through this construction up to transverse isotopy. Okay, so um, okay, so that's one direction. So you can get any transverse knot in this way, but you can also think of the class of transverse knots up to isotopy as being braids modulo some some things. And so this is the content of the transverse Markov theorem. illegible enough, then any misspellings will sort of disappear. Uh, so, was that more or less correct? That's correct. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so this this is a, a transverse not version of the usual Markov theorem. So this says that um, two so two braids B1 and B2 correspond to the same uh, transverse knot. If and only if they're related by, well, if they're the same transverse knots, then that means that they're the same smooth knots, which means that they're related by some sequence of Markov moves. And for them to be the same transverse knot, there's some subset of those. So the, the relevant Markov moves are conjugation in the break group and uh, positive stabilization and destabilization. So um, there are two types of stabilization, so I'll just draw the positive one. So this takes a braid, which somewhat perversely I draw from left to right, and adds an additional strand to it, and a positive crossing. Okay, so a negative stabilization is, is the other one where you put in a, a negative crossing there instead of positive. Um, Okay, so this is great. So if, if you don't want to think about contact geometry, you can just think of transverse knots as being braids, but modulo these uh, sort of restricted Markov moves. Um, okay, so, so just some general remarks. So invariance under uh, transverse isotopy. So one of them is just the topological type of the knot. So So of course if you have a transverse knot, you can just forget that it's transverse and it's still a knot. Um, And there's an additional one which is called the self-linking number. Um, Which in in this language is very easy to state, so this is just the self-linking number of a transverse knot is defined in terms of a braid that gives it as the rise of the braid, so that's the algebraic crossing number, minus the number of strands of the braid. Um, so you can see it's self-evident that you know, given the transverse Markov theorem, these, these are, this is an invariant, so uh, conjugation doesn't change this, and positive stabilization is, uh, this is exactly set up so that each of these increases by one under positive stabilization, so the difference remains the same. Okay, so this is just an integer. Uh, in fact, for one component knots, so this is always a, an odd integer. Okay, so, right. How far over can I go in this direction? Okay. Okay. Um, right. So, <coughs> Let's say uh, a topological knot, a smooth smooth knot type is called transversely simple. Well, if these are in that particular type, uh, self-linking number is the only invariant. So, um, or that completely characterizes, that characterizes everything. So, if all transverse representatives. are uh, 
you completely classified by their self making number. Okay. Um, so some, some examples of this that have been around for a while. So there, well, some of these more longer than others. So there's the n dot. This is the old result of Eliashberg's. Well, okay, relatively old result of Eliashberg's. Um, there are torus knots, and I'm going to stick in here also the figure eight knot, and this is an iron Honda. Um, I, I had been mistakenly attributing torus knots to Ednayer, but he tells me that, uh, that that was only for positive torus knots, I guess, and, and he and Honda did, did the full case. So. Okay, so let's see, what else do we have? There, there are a bunch of other things. I'm, I'll just mention one of them, which is that there are some twist knots. So twist knots, sorry. Knots like this with some number of half twists in there. Uh, and this is, yes. work of myself and John and Vera Bertucci. And there, there are others that, okay, so I'll just uh, leave it at that. Um, okay, so, okay, this is starting to make me nervous. Let's see. I guess I have space. Okay, so what about, so these are transversely simple. are transversely not simple, which in some sort of semantic miracle is supposed to be the negation of transversely simple. So um, uh, the, the, the first couple of knots that I know of that were shown to be transversely non simple were, so one of them was the 2, 3, or possibly 3, 2 cable of the trefoil. I'm sorry. These are things that are not determined by the top of, by the self linking number. So there exists. Oh, the simple ones. Yes. Uh, that's right. So, uh, but but transversely simple means that you fix a particular topo topological type. And so yeah. Okay. So um, this is an iron Honda. Um, there's also famously a, a class of three braids. Uh, I won't write this out, so I'll just say some three braids are closures of three braids, and this is work of Pyramid and Manasco. Um, so those have been around for a little while now, so let me just list some things that have been done since then. So there's, there's some sort of sporadic uh, examples so there, there are families beginning with the mirror of 10.132. Um, uh, let me just be very vague and say some others. Um, there are some that are in families. There are some that are just sort of sporadically uh, running around. And uh, I'll explain what I mean by some others in a second. But this is so uh, maybe um, uh, Peter and Dylan and myself. And uh, there's been other work, so Tirasan, and myself, uh, and there's been some other things along these lines. And, and uh, again, I'll say a little bit more about these in a second. And I should also mention some twists, since I mentioned twist knots before, so, so some twist knots are transversely non-simple. Um, the smallest one being uh, the mirror of 7-2. It's a fairly small knot. Um, and this is uh, Peter and Anders Stipchitz. Um, okay, great. So, um, what I'm interested in right now, well, I'll be interested in the particular knots in a second, but for right now, I, I wanted to say something about the techniques that 
get used to show this. Um, so this first one here, the 2-3 cable of the 2-3 torus, uh, just, there are also some other examples in this family now. Uh, but this is, this is really using some, some sort of contact geometric techniques, so um, uh, convex surfaces, dividing curves, uh, abbreviated by dividing curves. So, some sort of very top, contact topological stuff. Um, Graham and Manasco use some, uh, again, I'll sort of gloss over it as, as braid theory, uh, some sort of understanding of, of braids and how they behave under the Markov theorem so to, to get their results. And everything else that I have listed on here is through an invariant. So, so these two somehow are, these are great results. They're, they're somehow a little bit ad hoc. So um, they don't, they don't apply to, well, no, that's not completely true, but they're, they're sort of hard to apply to some other examples. Um, these, these other things down here are all coming from something that I'll talk about in a second, which is the, a transverse invariant. Actually, let me talk about it now. But it's, it's an invariant from not pluralmology. So, um, I actually don't want to talk about this very much, but I'll, I'll just mention that uh, it's, it's useful to see sort of the way that this works. So, so the way this works is that if you have a transverse knot of topological, so I'll, I'll sort of abbreviate its topological type as K, then this, so Peter, Wilson, and Dylan, Associated to this, and there's there's also related work of. Okay, I'm not going to keep writing out all the names. So let's go Orshvats and Zabo, and also some work of. Uh, sorry, it's so that yeah. They're, okay. Also, let's go Orshvats and Zabo, and uh, some related work of Honda because that's not and some other people. Uh, so so the construction is that if you start with this transverse knot, you end up with some invariant. I'll just give the most basic thing, which is you get a hat invariant that I'll write as theta hat of t, and this sits inside of the not pluralmology, the hat not pluralmology of, for some reason, the mirror of k. Um, so it just gives you an element sitting inside of here. And you can use this um, to to show that various knot types are transversely not simple. So the, the general idea is that you have, in each of those knot types, you have maybe two transverse knots with the same self-linking number, and then you can somehow distinguish them using this. So the, the original things that we did with this were, were sort of stupid things where you have two transverse knots, and one of them, the invariant, is zero, and one of them is non-zero. So they're evidently different. Um, you can be a little bit less stupid, and, and so this, these twist knot examples of uh, Peter and Andras um, use some sort of naturality for this invariant, actually for the loss invariant under, um, well, under transverse isotopy. And, and then you can get a little bit. So there, there you can see that uh, you have two transverse knots, and they actually both have non-zero invariants, but somehow you can see that those two non-zero elements inside of this group are actually different. So, um, okay, so, so this is great. Um, I should also mention that there, there are lots of other uh, invariants of transverse knots. Uh, that are of similar flavor and in fact predate this. So um, I should say that Olga came up with sort of the classic canonical example of this. So there's an invariant, it's, it's a similar thing except there's an invariant of a transverse knot that's inside of uh, Kabanov or Redux Kabanov homology. Uh, and there's work of Hao Wu uh, in, so in uh, Kabanov Rosansky SLN homology. Some sort of invariant that sits inside of Humphrey, the categorification of the Humphrey polynomial, 
Uh, but it uh, hasn't been written up, so I won't put that in here. Uh, so there are some other things. But uh, the difference between, at least as it currently stands, between this invariant in Hager Fleur, in not Fleur homology, and these other invariants, is that these ones have not been shown to be what's called effective. So these have not. not been shown, and maybe in fact might not be, to be effective. And what I mean by effective is that you can actually use them to distinguish transverse knots. So, effective means can, okay, there's a negation in here. So, have not been shown to be effective where effective means can distinguish transverse knots. with the obvious stipulation, so with, with the same topological type and the same self-linking number. Yes? Um, does the theta hat invariant also distinguish these three braids and the two uh, Good, yeah. excellent question. So uh, this invariant, at least for the small examples of this three braid family, does not distinguish them. Um, my, I, I would guess they just don't distinguish them at all. But, but this one, the invariant, the data add invariant, does distinguish the cable the example. In fact, there, there are smaller ones now. There's a, a one-two cable of a two-feet torus knot, or two-one, the one that goes around the longitudinal direction twice. Um, okay, so I've left out all sorts of people in this very quick survey, but I, I want to get to the new stuff. So. Um, I should mention that there's, there's one disadvantage to all of these invariants, including uh, the uh, not for homology invariant, which is that a lot of times, um, well, what do you get? So you get an element sitting inside of some abelian group. Uh, there are a lot of cases where one would guess that a knot is, I mean, is transversely not simple, but maybe this, this group, it's actually in some particular bigrading depending on the self linking number, maybe the group there is just zero, and then this invariant really doesn't tell you anything. Or else, I mean, there's this issue of, if you have two non-zero elements inside of here, how can you tell if they're the same or not? So, so there's some sort of s slight limitations to, to actually being able to use these things. Um, okay. So, um, what I want to do is I want to describe a new transverse invariant um, and again, this is going to be fairly hand wavy, so I'll just give you an overview and then I'm happy to fill in details of various things afterwards. Um, so the new invariant, uh, that I want to describe is something of a slightly different flavor. Um, and so let me just set up some notation. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to write R to be the ring, the group ring of Z squared, which I'll write as Z brackets lambda plus or minus one, mu plus or minus one. Um, and what, the, what this new invariant does is it takes a transverse knot of some topological type, which I'll write as K. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to use that. Yeah, I probably will. Okay. So, a transverse knot of type K, um, it associates to it um, some object which is actually an entire homology by itself. So, so this, uh, well, it's a chain complex. So, the other way it is CT star oops, with a minus, and the minus will be there for reasons that will become clear hopefully in a second. Um, so, this is a complex. This is actually, uh, so this is. complex associated to T, and uh, what is it? It's actually, it's a finitely generated um, I have to get in all the words, so I guess semi-free you can ignore that if you like uh, differential graded algebra um, so this is finitely generated as an algebra um, and it's uh, it, the thing that underlies it. If you if you forget about the differential, this is just a tensor algebra. So 
underlying algebra is free, so it's, well, I guess that was in the semi-free already. Um, and the important thing is, what is this an algebra over? It's an algebra over the ring R brackets U, V, where U and V are, are two new uh, things uh, that have degree zero. That's one, one way that this differs a little bit from some other theories that otherwise look sort of similar. So U and V have degree zero. This is, well, the entire base ring is in degree zero. Thing which I'm not actually going to define for you. Um, so this theorem maybe I should attribute to the people I mentioned before and myself. Um, so one is that there exists a combinatorial form for this. But right now, it's in terms of a braid uh, corresponding to a transverse knot. Um, given a braid representative for T. Okay, and this this is the part that I'm going to sweep under the rug. So it's 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 actually not so bad, but it's a little bit much to write down right now. So I'll just leave it as that. At that. Uh, the next thing is that the chain homotopy type. Or actually, there's something maybe slightly stronger, uh, which is called stable tame isomorphism. Of this complex is a transverse invariant. So, Actually, combinatorially from the form in part one. So you just have to use the, the transverse Markov theorem and check that the, this chain homotopy type is invariant under um, you know, conjugation and positive stabilization. Okay. Um, and the third part is that the homotopy type of Actually, maybe I should just leave this blank for now. Oh no, I'll put it. That's, it's annoying if, I, if people leave things blank on the board, right? So, so okay, so um, I'll write it down, but I'll explain what it is in a second. CT infinity is invariant not just under transverse isotopy, but actually under any uh, topological isotopy. explain what this thing is. But this again just uses the regular markup theory. We just have to check that now that the homotopy type of this thing is also invariant under negative stabilization. Okay, so um, Are the homology groups of this complex effective? So, uh, yes. So, in fact, the only thing that I ever use uh, as a uh, to distinguish transverse knots is the degree zero part of this, which is already sort of infinite dimensional in general as a module over this ring. But it's somehow you can still you use the algebra structure on it. Other questions? Yes. Uh, sorry, of an orientable knot. An oriented knot. Uh, yes. So, in theory, one could use this also to to distinguish knots from the orientation reverses. But I, that's hard, and it's hard for a reason that's similar to something else I'll discuss in a second. So, um, it's just, when you change the orientation, you you change the this complex in some very subtle way. And, yeah. 
Okay, so, right, so let me draw the picture. So the picture is, uh, this is going to be a schematic picture for all, all the various invariants. So you start off with this uh, complex, and this is, I'm going to keep track of the base ring. So this is over R brackets UV. And this is sort of the, the thing that everything comes from. Um, those of you who are bigger floor people, you, you know why I'm calling this a minus theory. You can see, well, okay, forget about the beater, you know. It, it looks like the minus version of the thing that you know about. Um, so one thing you can do is you can specialize this to, to knock the base ring down to something smaller. And in particular, okay, it's probably not going to be clear why this is useful. And in fact, it's not completely clear to me why this is useful. But you can, uh, you can specialize by setting u as 0 and v as 1. And then you get what I'll write as the hat complex. And this is now a complex over R. We've gotten rid of the U and the V. Um, you could do something similar, except set both U and V equal to zero. And for reasons that I don't quite understand, this seems like the natural thing to do, but for reasons that I don't quite understand, this, this actually leads to, a, in practice, a not quite as good invariant. But anyway, I'll put it in also. So I'll call this the double hat complex. And these, so these things here are both transverse invariants. Uh, the fact that those are transverse invariants up to how much happy is, I mean, that follows directly from this. So we've just done some algebraic trickery. Um, so this, this third thing is how you can get topological invariants out of this. So one of them is to localize, so allow inverses of u and v, so tensor by R brackets u plus or minus 1, v plus or minus 1, and then you end up with some complex that, that is this infinity thing. So CT infinity. And now I'll write it as a function of k, the underlying knot, uh, topological knot, because this is actually a topological invariant. Um, okay, so that's just taking the complex and, and changing the base ring. So now this is over. this thing. Um, and one other thing you could do if, if all of these u's and v's are too much is you can set u, is, u and v both equal to 1 and you end up with um, something that if you've seen me give talks about not contact homology before is actually the thing that I've talked about. So this is um, this is really horrid mutation. Sorry. Okay, so those are, so that of course you could get directly from this complex by just directly setting u and v equal to 1. And these, these two things are now topological invariants. How am I doing? Okay. Um, and then what I'm calling transverse homology maybe is the uh, the homology of these various complexes. So, so it comes in all sorts of flavors. Oh, it's done. Um, Why is that all that characteristic for those complexes? Um, hard to say. So the only characteristic, it's a little bit hard to say because it's, uh, this is an infinitely, it's infinite rank of, in general, in each degree. Uh, so in each degree, it's infinite rank. Uh, you, you could still look at things like proof rates uh, under some sort of filtration. Uh, that's, I think, a sensible thing to do and has not really been done yet. Um, but there are also ways to extract from this various um, finite rank complexes. And then uh, the Euler characteristic, well, something like the Euler characteristic for this one uh, then gives you the Alexander polynomial of the knot. Um, but though in a different that should be taken with a grain of salt. So with, in a very different way than the Euler characteristic for Hager floor. It's about, well, maybe I just won't touch that. But, yeah. All right, so, um, so the homology of these various complexes is what I'll call transverse homology. Uh, over 
of the rings, but the complexes are finally generated as algebras over these rings. Um, okay, and, and uh, other questions? Okay, so um, uh, let me just introduce the notation. So if you take the homology of these various things, I'll just replace the C by an H. So uh, these come in various flavors. So there's minus transverse homology. There's hat homology and double hat homology, transverse homology. Um, and then there's the infinity version. Whoops. Um, oh, so again, the Hager flow people will, of course, wonder why I've left out all the other various flavors you could come up with. So I don't know any, I mean, I haven't used the other, you could construct a plus version of this and so forth, and I don't, this is already hard enough for me, so I'll just leave it with this. Um, so this, sorry, this is now an invariant of a, of a topological knot, and uh, So the invariant of this last thing I have over there, the homology of that last thing is, so this is, this is what uh, I call in the past not contact homology. Um, and I'll say something about not contact homology uh, right after this. So this, this is sort of the, the zoo of various invariants and, and the, uh, whether it's a function of T or K is supposed to represent whether it's a transverse invariant or a topological invariant. So, um, since I have not told you anything about how to find anything, I, won't, I will continue not telling you anything about that now, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you some, some properties or applications of these invariants. And then I'll use, after that, then I'll use the rest of the time to, to tell you at least where these invariants come from and why it's an, an interesting thing to study. This is due to me. So this, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, is tell you what was state of the art five years, yikes, five years ago. So that, um, so that was just about not contact homology. So one of the things is that um, the complex uh, for not contact homology. So remember that's that thing down in the bottom right, uh, encodes the Alexander polynomial of the knot. Uh, I think. I should not say things off the cuff, but I, I think that if you do this for links instead, then you probably get, you can get the multivariable Alexander polynomial, I think. Um, and again, the, the way that this works is you, you take some linearization of this complex, and that gives you a, something where the complex itself is actually finite rank, and then, uh, but it's over this weird ring R, and then, and then some of the, um, well, the information of that complex boils down to essentially the Alexander polynomial. Okay, so um, the next thing is that if you take the degree zero, so this turns out to be supported in non-negative degree. That's actually true for everything. Um, so this is sort of the, the smallest degree part. So the degree zero part of this, um, so this is now an algebra in its own right over R. Remember R is, Um, this thing has a purely topological uh, description. So the way that I originally defined this complex was through some combinatorics in terms of a, a braid whose closure is the knot. But you can actually just see directly that this, the, at least the degree zero part of this, it is a topological invariant and it has some nice, um, sort of what I call it, a purely topological formulation. And those of you who have seen me talk about this before, this is the, what I call the core algebra, which I will now not mention again. Um, well, one nice thing out of this topological formulation is you can get results such as the following. So 
Um, the degree zero part of the not contact homology uh, determines the uh, uh, detects the unknown. This is somehow much less useful than saying that, say, Kavanaugh homology detects the unknown, because this is not a finite dimensional thing in general. It's just some, some big algebra over this base ring R. But nevertheless, you get something like this. And the original way that I proved this was using the fact that the A polynomial detects the unknown. So there's some relation to the A polynomial. So essentially, out of this thing, you can also get something that's not quite the A polynomial, but is pretty close. Others of you who know this. And then the fact that the A polynomial detects the unknot, um, which is due to Dunfield and Garofalidis, and is bu builds on work of Kronhammer and Rufka. Um, there's actually a, a simpler proof now uh, that is in a paper that seems like it will not see the light of day. So I, I can tell you about it at some point if you want. But it's it's uh, it, it actually turns out that you don't need something that fancy. You don't need an engage theory. All you need is the loop theorem. So it's so also can also prove using nothing more complicated than the loop theorem. Okay. Um, great. So, okay, so this is something, and, and I think it, it's a, I mean, I find this scenario to be pretty interesting. It, I have been beating my head against the wall for a long time, trying to get it to be related to other uh, not invariants that we know and love, and have not really succeeded except for what's mentioned here. Um, I should mention that, that one of my hopes with this, this new stuff is that this, this invariant, in, in theory, is, is a little bit richer than that one. You haven't set u is, v is equal to 1. So it, it's possible that one might be able to extract from this some, something that would relate us to other non invariants. Um, Okay, so that was the old stuff. So here's some new stuff. So the, uh, actually, this theorem only has one part. Uh, I'll put in another part that the experts, but uh, the, the part that is most interesting is that the degree zero hat version of this is an effective transverse invariant. And I'll try to give you some sort of data about this in a second. Um, and the second part, which again is only for experts, is um, so you may ask how this invariant behaves under uh, negative stabilization. Um, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, but if you just look at the double hat version, you get something that's That behaves in the following way. So as soon as you take the double hat version of this theory, uh, if t is a, a negative stabilization, so that is a transverse stabilization of some other transverse knot, then this is zero. Oh, I forgot to mention one other thing. Sorry. So that's uh, that's uh, negative. In the break world, this is a negative stabilization. I, I should mention that. Uh, this and it's non vanishing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Non trivial. So, so this actually gives you something that, that doesn't vanish somehow. Um, so that follow uh, well, okay. Anyway. So, uh, what I want to do now is I want to convince you of this first statement, and by convince I mean I'll, I'll throw some numbers at you, and hopefully that will be enough. Okay, so, um, So how, how can we use this thing to get a trend, an effective invariant? So this, this thing uh, is an algebra over R brackets, no, just over R. Um, 
And like I said, it's finally generated. Well, no, the complex is finally generated. Somehow this is a this is a big thing. But what you can do is you can try to count uh, what I would call representations of this. So you can count maps, algebra maps from this to your favorite finite field. Um, and there's some other only finitely possibly many of those. And this is something you can actually just plug into a computer and have it do for you. So so the point is that uh, given the combinatorial form for this complex, you can just plug it into a computer and ask it to count numbers, and it'll just pop out a bunch of numerical invariants out of this. Um, so, uh, you, you can map to your favorite, my favorite finite field is Z mod P for some small value of P that can be as small as 3, I think. Um, so, counting. Maps like this gives numerical invariance uh, of the transverse knot, and and these numerical invariants are what I would say are sort of unreasonably effective in in distinguishing them. So I, I don't really understand why this is so, but um, I've checked and double checked, and, and it, it seems to be true. So so um, but let me give some some evidence of of how effective this is. So. There's, there's some uh, work of a student of mine, ex student, Top uh, Chung and myself, uh, to come up with some sort of atlas of Legendrian knots. And you, can, you can find this on my webpage. Um, and this is some sort of conjectural uh, list of all Legendrian knots of topological type of knots with arc index at most 9. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that later, but I should press onwards. So, um, from this knot atlas, there are, so, of knots with arc index, at least 9, uh, this atlas, so this atlas was sort of produced by a computer, and the computer guesses that there are 12, so, there are maybe guessed, there are 12 knots, Conjecturally, transversely non-simple, um, and all of the other ones are conjectured to be transversely simple. Uh, again, uh, as the knot gets more complicated, this conjecture is made with less and less uh, certainty or something. Um, so, how do they, so these, they start with the mirror of seven two, which has already appeared on the board at some point. And the next one is the mirror of seven six, and then they go up from there. There are a bunch of nine crossing dots and, and things. So, so of these, um, one can actually prove that five of them are are transversely simple. So this was the case already before the work that I'm talking about now. So five, five of them are, were proven to be transversely non-simple by this. Not for homology invariant. Um, so this this was who am I attributing this to? So Oshpat and Stipschitz uh, and myself and Oshpat and Thurston, and then this this work also has a little bit of this uh, to get those five. Um, the other seven cannot be proven to be transversely non-simple by this for for sort of triviality reasons that I mentioned before. Um, so of these 12 knots, 9 are, are proven to be transversely non-simple by this degree 0 transverse homology, um, including all of those 5. So this, you know, can draw some sort of trivial Venn diagram. So some, uh, out of these 12 knots, there, there are 5 of them that are transversely non-simple by this. There are 4 more that are proven by transverse homology. Uh, and then there are still three left. And the three, did I do my math right? No. Yes. 12 minus 9 is 3. Okay. So um, these three are going to be quite hard to distinguish, and maybe I can spend a second to explain why that is, and then I want to, I want to still say something about where this invariant comes from. Um, so the other three are uh, what I calling transverse mirrors. What's a, so what's a transverse mirror? So if you take a braid, uh, 
you can just reverse the order of, of the letters in the braid. So you have a braid word, so just reverse the, the order of the letters. And we'll get what I'll call the mirror of B. This is probably called something else. Okay, I don't know. Anyway, so it reverse the word order. And this topologically gives you the orientation reverse of the knot you started off with, but uh, suppose that your knot is invertible, then, then you can ask, this gives you, in theory, what could be a different transverse knot. And in fact, this seems to happen sometimes. Um, so, uh, so you get pairs of knots uh, on transverse knot on its mirror, and the, the three that can't be distinguished by this, as far as I know, are, are transverse mirrors, as are the Beerman Manasco examples. So, are transverse mirrors. Um, and the point is that these are really hard to distinguish in general. In fact, I don't know of any invariant that can do it at this point. So, the Hagar Flora invariant definitely does not do it. Uh, this transverse homology invariant maybe can, but the deal is that, uh, so how is the invariant for the mirror of a transverse knot related to the original one? So, uh, this transverse homology complex uh, changes by, uh, to its sort of the opposite complex. And by this I just mean uh, you take the differential and you reverse the order of the letters in all of the words in the differential. Or that is to say, you take your tensor algebra, you run it through a machine that reverses all the words of everything in the tensor algebra. So this is not an algebra map, but anyway. Then you apply this, the original differential, and then you reverse everything back. So uh, anyway, maybe I won't say more about that. But this, this is something that is going to be extremely difficult to uh, distinguish. Uh, not impossible, but it seems like it would be pretty hard. If, in particular, these numerical invariants won't do it. You somehow need the non-commutativity of the complex. Uh, yes? No, so if, if you have a topological knot that's invertible, then, then you get something that's topologically the same. Um, and, but it could still be a different transverse knot, and that seems to be sometimes true. Is there another question? Same question. So about these three, you're just saying there's three knot types that happen to be invertible, and therefore there's this problem. There are three knot types that happen to be invertible, and where this computer program that produced this produces things that it thinks are transversely different that are transverse mirrors. Yes? So how many things were in the other category? Uh, the arc index less than or equal to nine knots that uh, so how many arc index nine nuts are there? <laughs> I forgot. I mean, it's, it's a it's a fairly big list, and this is a very small subset of that. So that includes what up to seven crossing knots and up to nine crossing knots with that are non-alternating and a bunch of other sort of higher ones. And the mirrors. So all of those are known to be simple. No, all of those are guessed to be simple. So there's there's nothing for me to test this invariant against. Uh, some of them have been proven to be simple, I guess the ones that I wrote down before. But a lot of them it's just not known. Okay, so, great, so I have five minutes to give the other half of my talk. Um, so this will be pretty brief. I've been, so since I've been very coy about where this comes from, let me try to say something about what, what, where this inverse homology come from. And this is this co-normal construction that I mentioned before. And the idea, so I'll tell you the idea up to this recent work. So the idea was that if you have some sort of some manifold sitting inside of a manifold. So M is smooth. So what we're supposed to think is a knot sitting inside of R3. You can promote this into sort of the symplectic category. So the cotangent bundle of M, uh, as is well known, is, is a naturally symplectic manifold. And sitting inside of the cotangent bundle of this, we can look at the co-normal bundle 
which I shocking change of terminology. I'm going to write this way. So this is um, this is the conormal K. So if you like, it's it's the set of points in the cotangent bundle, so that Q is in K and P is conormal to the tangent directions at K. So P annihilates. all the tangent vectors. So you can convince yourself that no matter what, what the dimensions, this, this is always half the dimension of, of the whole thing. And in fact, it's natural Lagrangian submanifold. So the idea is that um, any sort of, so we, we've passed from the smooth world into the symplectic world, and then any sort of symplectic invariant of this Lagrangian submanifold sitting inside of there gives you an isotopy invariant of, of the original knot. Symplectic. This is a bit of an over, oversimplification, oversimplification, but anyway, give isotopy invariance. Okay, and in particular, there's one that's been well studied, which is called uh, Legendrian contact homology. Uh, again, oversimplification, but uh, so the Legendrian contact homology of this thing. gives um, what I was writing as not contact homology for a knot in R3. You could do this in much more generality, but it's, it's not known how to compute it in general. Um, so, right. in fact, it actually gives this infinity version of the transverse homology, but I didn't realize this at first. Um, okay, so where do we use the fact that the knot is transverse? So this is all just, you have a knot sitting inside of R3, a uh, smooth knot. But now if, if the knot is actually transverse, so let's say that we have the standard contact structure in R3, and we have a transverse knot in here. So the, the contact structure itself, so this is a two-plane distribution on R3. This also has a conormal lift. You just define it exactly the same way, essentially. It's, it's just uh, over every point in R3 in the cotangent bundle, it picks up the uh, direction that's co-normal to the, to the entire contact plane. And there are two of these things. So there's, there's this co-orientation issue. So there are actually two of these um, sitting inside of T star R3. And you can do a dimension count, and I, I, I won't. I actually more or less just said it, but uh, the dimension count says that each of these two lifts, so these are conormal lifts of the contact structure into the cotangent bundle, these both have dimension four. So these are four dimensional in what? In the six dimensional manifold. And if you set up your, your uh, symplectic geometry correctly, you can set this up so that both of these four dimensional things are actually holomorphic. So you can set up. Maybe I should write this as n star plus or minus 6c. Anyway, so these are holomorphic. So now they're holomorphic four-dimensional manifolds. And if you know something about the contact homology, that counts holomorphic surfaces, or disks in this case. Um, so you can, and the, the point is that the fact that T is transverse says that the conormal lift to A, so T transverse, says that this is disjoint from these other two things. So then you can actually use these holomorphic four manifolds to filter the complex, the whatever complex you get from here that counts holomorphic disks. And those, those filtrations lead to these U and V. So count intersections of holomorphic disks the ones that give you contact homology, which I haven't told you about. Uh, but those are holomorphic disks with boundary on, on this thing here. And we can count intersections of those holomorphic disks with these holomorphic four manifolds sitting inside of some six-dimensional space uh, in, with C. And this gives you powers of well, what I'm calling U and D. So you get that somehow you promote the base ring uh, from 
from R, which for some reason is what it was in conduct homology, to R brackets U B by counting these intersections. And the point is that you don't need the inverses of U and B because uh, all of the intersections are positive because everything inside is homomorphic. Um, the disjoint condition is because they're transverse. You actually need a little bit more to, to say that this new filtration is invariant. So you need something like that no rape cord ever passes through this, these things also, so that you can't have intersections sort of running off the boundary punctures. But yeah, that's right. So, so the fact that these are disjoint is precisely the, the fact that T is transverse. Okay, so I'm out of time. So that's, anyway, that's a very brief explanation, and I'm happy to talk about it later. But, uh, all right, thanks. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Actually, there's some sort of symmetry that... Yeah, so there's some symmetry that interchanges the two of them, and so setting u is 0 and v is 1 is actually more or less equivalent to setting u is 1 and v is 0. But u... Okay, so actually I don't know that the v filtration is useful for anything, or that the second filtration is useful for anything, but at least one of these filtrations is. So I was setting u to be the plus left and v is the minus left. Is there any hope to get Legendrian invariants out of this? Um, there is hope. But so the, the first thing that I thought of is to do something similar to what's done in Hager floor, which is to say that it, there you have, you know, a Legendrian, given a Legendrian knot, you have two push offs that are transverse, and then you just look at sort of the difference between the invariants for those. But that requires that the complex for those two push offs is actually the same. Uh, here, if you take a Legendrian knot, then the two push offs look like they sit in different complexes, so I, I'm not completely sure offhand. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is, uh, given a Legendre knot or maybe a grid diagram or something, get, get some sort of nice small way of, of describing this complex and then maybe that would give it to you, but I, I don't have it yet. Can you hope for a conjecture classification? Um, right now it's too far. So now it seems like, especially with all the techniques we have, that it's fairly, I don't want to say easy, but it's, it's doable in a lot of cases to show that things are transversely non-simple. But so, so you can show that things are different fairly easily. Showing that you've classified everything is somehow the other side, and that, that um, has been done in particular not types, but it requires some sort of at this point, it requires some sort of analysis of convex surfaces and, and things. So it's, it's, a, it's pretty tricky and hasn't been done for much of anything. <laughs>